Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation in virtual mode, as it has been for the last six months or so, I guess. We've done about 160, 170 videos, which are available on our, our website. We haven't, during this period, looked at one of the main pastimes in this country, football. But football finance is a real, real live issue. It's a live issue, not least because of all the various proposals that are being put forward for the reorganization of European football along American lines, uh, for the problems that the coronavirus has caused, uh, particularly to the smaller clubs, but I guess also to the bigger clubs, which are said to be losing large amounts of money. Uh, change is coming. Um, and I'm delighted that we've been able to find three people who really do know what that change is. Dan Jones is uh, the lead partner and head of the Sports Business Group at Deloitte. He's also the editor of Deloitte's annual review of football finance, now in its 29th issue, and the Football Money League, which is now, I think, in its 18th year here has, I think, written extensively on the problems of uh, problems posed by a European uh, Super League. He's been rather negative on the financial outlook. The Premier League lost £1 billion, uh, £1 billion in uh, now 20, 2019-2020 uh, after record revenues the previous year. Um, I think he's, uh, he's somebody who the rest of the industry really listens to. Murad Ahmed is the Financial Times' sports editor. Uh, he's the editor of FT Scoreboard on the business of sport. He's also the co-chair of the FT's Business of Football Summit. Um, he's a former European technology correspondent and previously worked at the Times. He also has written uh, against the dangers of a private league of big European clubs. Batting cleanup, as it were, is Andrew Ahrens, uh, an economic historian educated at Oxford and Harvard, or a former lawyer, a former investment banker, a former venture capitalist who has recently, oh, and also a former journalist at the Financial Times, who has recently completed a PhD in, uh, in the, I suppose, the history of the financial aspects of European football. Uh, that's the running order. My colleague, Jane Fuller, and I will fill in any holes, if uh, indeed there are any holes to fill in. Uh, let's have uh, Dan kick off. Where, where, does, where does football and where does football finance stand today? Dan Jones. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, glad to be joining such a illustrious panel, um, virtually from uh, our respective uh, front rooms or back bedrooms or wherever else we may be, uh, be working in the current time. So I hope everyone is keeping themselves safe and well. Um, so it's been an extraordinary year, really, 2020 in, in many respects. And, and that, obviously, football finance has not been immune from that. Um, I worked on my first annual review of football finance uh, around about the time of Euro 96. Um, I worked on my first strategic review job in uh, football in 1997 on a review of the English Football League. Um, and so I've seen a lot of these sort of issues and I've seen a lot of them come around uh, a number of times. Um, so just in terms of a couple of things that, that have happened over this sort of most extraordinary of years, really, um, clearly football and football finance has been negatively affected by, by the crisis. Um, that, that's no shock to anybody. Um, the industry sort of stopped um, pretty much overnight and then obviously went through its, through its project restart. And I'll, I'll talk primarily from an English football perspective, but a, a number of the themes um, apply across across Europe. So what, what we saw was obviously the cessation of match day attendance and actually the cessation of football for a period and then return to our TV screens was, was welcome back. Um, government assistance cooperation between government and Premier League and the broadcasters to, to get the game back on TV. And I think people would, by and large, say that it's worked pretty well, um, the restart process. And in terms of financials, what we expect to see when we get to our next annual review of football finance will, will be a very significant dip for the first time ever in the revenues of the Premier League. But bear in mind that that's because, in effect, the, the clubs all have year ends that are in the summer. So they have their year ends to coincide with the end of a football season. So the dip will be exaggerated when we produce our annual review of football finance next year that relates to the 20, 2020 year ends. 
because it will pick up effectively about 75% of a football season. When we look at the 2021 year ends, then that will pick up 15 months because it will pick up the, the last quarter that was delayed into the summer of the 1920 season and the full 2021 season. Obviously, one of the imponderables for this current season is when we might see fans back in stadium and to what extent and what that means for, for match day revenue. And also over the coming years, it'll be interesting to see what the impact is on sponsorship and commercial revenue. But, but I think what the pandemic and the public's reaction to sport more generally, but Premier League football and, and professional football generally as, a, as an example, has shown is that the fundamentals remain incredibly strong. The, the passion that people have for football, the way that translates into their, their viewing habits, their interests, the, the fact that, frankly, for a lot of people, the, the canary in the coal mine of the seriousness of the situation was that their, their football stopped. And again, people looking you know, intently at you know, when can it restart and whether that's at grassroots or whether it's at the Premier League level, you know, a, a, a crucial part of you know, what binds a society together, what a society is passionate about is its sport and its football in particular. And from a business point of view, whilst the, the pain has been acute, the long-term prospects, I think, remain very, very sound. In terms of one of the specific um, things that you alluded to, Andrew, and there's lots of topics we could talk around, around, uh, you know, possible fan-led reviews, around Project Big Picture, but one of the ones that keeps coming up and... Um, I'd sort of just finish with my sort of opening comments is the European Super League. Now, again, over the duration of my time working in this industry, the idea of the European Super League comes up on a pretty regular cycle. Uh, that cycle, not coincidentally, tends to run around about the same time as the decisions around UA for club competition structures and rights cycles. So the risk in something like this is that, I'm not sure if it means you're the boy who cried wolf or the boy who didn't cry wolf, but... Um, you're always right in what I'm about to say until the moment when you're wrong. But so far, um, my, my view that a European Super League isn't going to happen has always proved to be right. Um, my reasons for that are, are, are many and varied, but I think the, the, the fact of the matter is that the European Super League already exists. It's called the UEFA Champions League. Um, it runs in parallel to national competitions. I think it suits... Um, everybody very well that that is the situation um, if I am a major brand in a domestic market a uh, major club um, coming 8th 13th 12th in three successive years in the European Super League is not as exciting as competing to win my domestic league possibly picking up a domestic cup and going into the knockout stage to the Champions League each season that is a much more exciting combination and a much better story to tell about my club and so I think at that very fundamental level, I'm not sure that the um, the speculation about the European Super League holds that much merit. Um, I've seen the numbers banded around this time. I've seen a £5 billion investment talked about. And obviously that's an eye-catching number. But then you look at the sort of value that's just being attributed to someone taking a 10% stake in Europe's third or fourth most successful league currently in Serie A, and suddenly that number being attributed to the creation of European Super League that would, at its most extreme, break with all the existing structures of football. You know, what would that mean for players about being able to represent their national teams? Where would various federations stand on it? What happens to domestic leagues, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I think it takes an awful lot more than that for someone to come in and fix something that isn't broken. Okay, I have two questions for you. One is a philosophical question and one is a specific one. The philosophical question is, is football still a sport or is it a business? The specific one is just tell us a little bit more about Project Big Picture because that was the attempt, I suppose, to trickle down some of the benefits or to buy off the op opposition uh, to issues like a Super League uh, by smaller clubs. Just a little, If you just fill us in a little bit on that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, look, I think I think football is a sport and it's a business. Um, the, the football that that I, I played and that my children play is very clearly a sport. And the football that um, Manchester United player Old Trafford is um, linked very closely to a very successful business. And I don't think that that is a problem. I think that the the sport, um, you know, is is ever stronger. Is 
more skillful, more entertaining, um, better delivered to the consumer, through, to the customer, to the fan, whether that's in the stadium. If I compare my experiences of going to watch uh, Manchester United play in the mid 1980s to the experience my children have now of going to watch them um, in the 2020s, um, I think, yeah, we have got to see one game in 2020. Yeah. Um, together. Um, you know, it's a, it's not a comparable experience. I mean, I was, I was going into, you know, situations where I was quite literally taking my life in my hands as a 14, 15 year old, um, going to stand on a crowded terrace. And I loved it. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely was captivated by it and will be held by it for life. But would I knowing what I know about what it felt like going into an away end in a, for a packed game, in 1984 or 85 want my children to be having that same experience as a parent absolutely not so I think you know football is a sport and a business in terms of um, project big picture you know there there are various facets to big picture and there are bits of it that different people would see to have different degrees of merit Um, the the, the principle of solidarity within the game is a really important principle uh, and is a principle that you know is observed now, people talk about equitable distributions of revenue, and I think a lot of times when they talk about equitable distributions of revenue, what they actually mean is equal distributions of revenue, because equitable is a value judgment, equal is a piece of arithmetic, and you know it's interesting as to you know where people where people sit on that on on that continuum. But it's worth noting, you know, there is pre-pandemic more money in the football league than there has ever been. The football league is a tremendously successful revenue generating machine over the lifetime of the Premier League. The problem the football league's had is that the Premier League has been even more successful and because its pace of growth has been that much faster, it has grown ever further away from the football league. But the football league has itself grown and there is enough money in English professional football to sustain all of our 92 professional clubs. Indeed, um, we have more than 92 professional clubs already. There are a number of non-league clubs that are professional. So, so, so the idea that there is this inevitable winnowing down of our number of clubs, uh, I think is a, is a false um, narrative. And I thought that in 1997 when I reviewed this, the Football League, and I definitely think it now, because if I said in 1997, this is how the finances will turn out over the next 20 years, from a revenue point of view, the league's member clubs would have been ecstatic the bit that they perhaps would have hoped they'd have got a better handle on by now was the costs. Okay, Murad, what's, what's your view on this? Murad Ahmed. I recently wrote about the, the kind of proposed Super League. It actually took months of reporting because it kept changing every single time I kind of delved into, uh, delved into it. And um, one of the key standouts I, I, I got from it was speaking to a private equity executive who had seen all the proposals and it had been pitched to him. Uh, the mastermind behind it is Fiorentino Perez, the the president of Real Madrid, one of the world's biggest clubs. He's the one that's really behind it and pushing it. He's the one that's got this kind of um, a debt plan with JP Morgan to try and launch this thing. Um, and the private equity executive said to me, um, he, he assessed it, as 85% chance we'll have a reform of the Champions League. Um, The current Champions League looking very different with a different format. Around 15% a a breakaway Super League and less than 1% chance of um, a real proper breakaway, which would have all the clubs abandon their current national leagues completely and set up a completely different competition. Um, And I think all all of those percentages from all my reporting sound right. But remember, 15% chances do happen. It's around the, uh, the, the chance that Donald Trump won the first um, presidential election when he, when he did, according to the polls. Those chances do come off um, and has to be taken seriously. And, and I think more, import- more, more importantly, just as Dan was saying, there's been talk since the early 1990s with Silvio Berlusconi trying to set up something like a Super League then with AC Milan and other clubs um, that there's a better chance than there has been uh, in the past. So there's a few reasons why there's a better chance of that happening. And there's a kind of confluence of factors that have to be taken into account. One is there's something uh, 
rather boring and technical, but it's called the International Match Calendar. It's a 10-year agreement between uh, national federations, uh, continental groups, uh, uh, and clubs on when exactly during a year competitions can take place and that expires in 2024 there has to be a new agreement um from that uh from there on in so there's a kind of there's a crux point uh where everything the whole calendar is up for grabs and one of the things that the big european football clubs who are the big actual businesses within the football ecosystem uh one is more european ties which make more money more big games between the games heavyweights um and they see that negotiation uh, as crucial to this the second thing is the pandemic as dan was pointing out we've had historic losses now um historic shortfalls of revenue and um and a lot of these clubs are worried about their financial position they are big businesses now and they want want to have um uh, a way of making more money in the future to avoid this uh, uh, scenario. Um, that being said, it's also just an opportunity, uh, as any crisis uh, is, to push these th- things through. And as one person said to me, there's a kind of a point to be made. Um, one club owner said, there's a point to be made by saying the big clubs have to stand together because the small clubs aren't going to survive the crisis. And this is the opportunity. Um the third thing, and I think this is actually probably the most crucial thing here, is the the entrance of institutional investing, um, and particularly from the US, um, into European football. They've been drawn firstly by these, uh, the growth of the game around the world. It is the world's favorite sport. It, it commands billions um, uh, of eyeballs around the world. And that is a huge business uh, opportunity but the kind of structure of the sport is incredibly fragmented it has very un-american ideas like relegation uh, involved which completely destroy the value of, of football clubs if um uh, and puts a ceiling to uh, how valuable they can be so we have investment banks setting up deals to tap the bond markets for clubs like Tottenham Hotspur and uh, Inter Milan. You um, have JP Morgan trying to fund this kind of Super League uh, idea. You even you have hedge funds who own football clubs, such as Elliott Management at a- AC Milan. And you have these billionaires at Liverpool, at Manchester United and, and so on, who who have experience in US leagues where they don't have things like relegation and they have regular returns on investment and want to implement not necessarily an NFL or an NBA exactly the same thing, but essentially create a new format, a new system, which allows them to be sure that they're, they have a return on investment, that they have regular revenues going into the future. You brought up Project Pick Picture earlier and one way of looking at project big picture which had like dan said lots of different elements to it some uh some i actually think are a lot less controversial than others but everyone has to remember that they were, what they were offering was a compromise we'll give you more money to the to the smaller clubs and in return what you will get is uh is more power to the bigger clubs but um one way to look at that was a way of making more space for more European matches, i.e. making more space for a Super League. Now, the Super League would not replace, the the proposed one, would not replace the National Leagues. It's intended to be played in midweeks, not uh, not during the weekend, and um, uh, uh, in in essence be a replacement to the Champions League. Um, And uh, the reason why that's... uh, attractive to these clubs is there wouldn't be a relegation from it even though you would have quite a lot of dead rubbers towards the end um and a kind of playoff system the top eight would go on to a quarterfinals whatever very american style um what they want is regular revenues they want to know how many european games that they're going to uh, going to get uh, how much they can sell against, and that gives them a level of certainty that um, that investors are looking for, and that is the kind of the driving force behind all of this. The, um, a lot of hard money is now looking at the sport and saying, "Well, it can't be run like it is currently for us to have our return on investment." So I think over the next six months to a year, we're going to see a lot of movement in this space, not necessarily Super League, but UEFA. 
I think the greatest chance is UEFA doing quite radical reforms to the Champions League to guarantee more matches uh, in Europe, to guarantee more matches between the biggest clubs in Europe. Uh, the problem with that is a greater, greater financial disparity and uh, inevitably sporting disparity between the really big clubs in Europe and everybody else. Okay, I mean, so what does that mean for the either the, the second tier of Premier League clubs or the aspirant clubs within the Championship, for instance? Good or bad? Well, it, it depends what you want from sport. Um, I think uh, just talking about sport rather than money, what you want is a relatively level playing field. You want matchups between two teams that are largely quite level and uh, allow some randomness because what you see is unpredictable. That's what's drawing people in. So if you have a big disparity between the top and bottom, you end up with quite boring matches, quite boring football. It becomes less interesting. I mean, we're, we're seeing this play out in Italy and Spain and Germany in particular, where the, the, the gap, the financial gap between top and bottom is huge. And so the leagues become very, very predictable. Um, so I think you're likely to get an exacerbated um, disparity between, between that and the Super League clubs would say, well, that's why we should all get together and pull, play more regular games against each other because that'll actually be more interesting. Um, and for the second tier, I think it's very, very Pro, uh, problematic because you end up, I think, uh, essentially with a devalued national league uh, setup. You know, some people I spoke to say, saying, "Well, if all that if all that matters is the Super League or even the Champions League, what you end up with is um, A teams or B teams um, uh, at clubs. The A teams play the European matches. The B teams play your national uh, national league matches." The other thing that could happen is opportunities arise. One of the things that I um, heard about was that there was a, a plan to create a pan-national competition between the top clubs in Scotland, mm -hmm. Ireland, Denmark, Sweden and Norway, which has been kind of kicking around uh, for a few years. Ryan Quinn, the financial regulator, the old financial regulator at the Bank of England, was one of the people who was pushing that oh, 20 years ago when before he went off to uh, chair Celtic, I think. Uh, right. OK. I mean, and Celtic is, is a kind of a key component of that. It would be the biggest club with it, within this group. And the idea is to create a, a more powerful league outside the kind of the big five of France, England, Italy, Spain, and Germany, and to create these kind of pan-national competitions. Uh, that fell apart, I, I was told, because Celtic have got it into their heads that there's a route to go and play in England soon, uh, which would make more money for them. And I think the idea is that the big clubs the big English clubs would kind of abandon the English league and Celtic see their way in. So you kind of, what you end up is with this big disruption, new uh, new uh, configurations appearing. It's all kind of up for grabs. I do end, end up thinking, though, that fundamentally, football clubs in particular, often in Europe, are 100 years old. They've been developed over decades and decades. Their fan bases grow over a really long period of time. They are fundamentally conservative institutions, uh, small c conservative institutions, in, in spirit and having a massive mega change really is, is unlikely. One person from the, who was in the Project Big Picture Talks told me, look, change only really happens when three or four people uh, who are quite radical in, in mindset get together and force it down the throats of everybody else. So um, I'm not sure that that group is really there to force a big radical change. I do think that group is kind of basically there to force big changes to the Champions League. And I think that's the likeliest thing to happen over the next year or so. Just a quick one on, on that. Um, if you wanted to have a, a bigger European competition with predictable dates, why not rationalise the Champions League and the Europa League? Uh, well, the, the reason for that is the second tier issue. 
So, so um, one of the things that they're actually doing is not even rationalizing uh, those two competitions, but actually expanding. So they are uh, having a third competition called the Europa Conference League, which is a terrible name. I'm not quite sure why they, they've called it that. But uh, they want more... Th- uh, I think everyone's agreed across Europe that they want Euro- more European club games, but they want the opportunity for the the champions of Albania and Armenia mm-hmm. to have um, an opportunity to rise up through the kind of wi- uh, wider pyramid. So what you might end up with is the 10th best team in England uh, playing against the champions of Macedonia on a, on a more regular basis in this third tier um, as well. That's their kind of idea of spreading spreading the wealth yeah. down. Like that, what's happened in the nations, some of the nations. Uh, okay, exactly. let's bring in exactly. Andrew Ahrens. Andrew has the great advantage of understanding both the American system and the English system. And the Americanization of uh, European sport is, I guess, a trend that's... Uh, probably irreversible. I would simply point out, and maybe uh, Andrew will disagree with me, that though the F- NFL and the uh, NBA are enormously successful, they have been successful at the expense of grassroots, American football, grassroots basketball. The old Continental Basketball League doesn't it scarcely exist anymore. There is virtually no professional football outside the NFL in America, uh, American football except, of course, through the college system. And the college system is basically uh, recruiting from an ever smaller pool. But Andrew, Andrew Ahrens, what's your view on all of this? Uh, Thank you, Andrew, and thank you uh, for inviting me. And I'm delighted to be included with Dan and Mirad. Um, Dan and his team have been thought leaders in this area for nearly 30 years. I have the first edition of 1992-3. I think it was the company accounts. I used to get them through the post. It was fantastic. They've really created the intellectual understanding of this industry. Uh, and I think that's been fantastic. And Mirad, I have to say, uh, has great things at the FT by having detailed coverage of football finance with a specialist team and some really good reporting and analysis. There's a small footnote in the 80s, uh, coverage was pretty sparse. Uh, There was a column by Trevor Bailey on Saturdays um, when it was not cricket season about football. Surprisingly, he knew very little about football, but still managed to write about it. And, And once a year, a junior reporter would be instructed to write 300 words on the annual review of football club accounts by Jordans, who put out the report each year. It was not a high profile job and seen as the short straw, I should know, because I actually did it one year. Um, but I rather cared about it. So it was interesting. Um, but coverage has expanded. And, and Andrew, you know, you'll, you'll be pleased to know that uh, various FT columnists still or still dip into uh, sport and write about the sport on a on a semi regular basis uh, uh, rather than us. And I, I agree that their, their, their mutterings don't tend to be uh, that great. Um, I have to say, I mean, I agree with with to sketch over what we were talking about with both Murad and, and Dan that the chances of a super league, as the American model would have it, is is very remote. I think it, Dan's absolutely right. I remember in 1998 um, when I was in my different life um, doing venture capital deals, being in the um, conference rooms of Slaughter and May while they were doing the competition. Uh, law coverage for the proposed Super League um, with a whole bunch of English football executives and um, very well-dressed Italians wearing sunglasses inside, all having negotiations in a, was clearly a negotiation um, to threaten UEFA before the reform of the the Champions League and the Europa Cup. Um, But just just a little bit of history on this. I mean, football finance is not a new subject, Andrew. It's always been a business. Um, wave of investment in the 1890s when the clubs turned into limited liability companies. Um, the founder of co-founder of the Football League, William Soodle, the uh, secretary for Preston North End, went to prison um, in 1893 for stealing money from the mill owner he worked for in order to fund the Invincibles. Uh, Woolwich Arsenal went bankrupt in 1910 and was rescued by uh, Henry Norris, the owner of Fulham. Man United should have gone bust in 1932, um, rescued by a rights issue by Salford businessman, James Gibson, with a package of 6 million um, in today's money. Um, Otherwise it would have suffered the fate of Accrington Stanley and Manchester City fans wouldn't have to worry about a rival across town. Um, Arsenal nearly went bankrupt in 1940 as the war started. 
Wolves went bust in the 70s. Tottenham nearly went under in the 80s. Um, Queen's Park Rangers has been a money pit um, for numerous owners. Uh, Crystal Palace as well, and, and Leeds very famously. And I think the inherent instability of English, of English and indeed European football is what I think is attractive to American investors. Um, they see um, the opportunity of, of what I might describe as a game of musical chairs, that if you, there is a Super League coming, if you happen to own one of the right clubs at the time when the music stops, you have the opportunity of being in that, that new closed league. Um, I think that's not going to happen. I think simply the regulatory authorities in, in uh, Brussels will not see or not allow a uh, cartel to be established on the way that this Super League has been proposed by certainly some of the equity investors. Um, there are two models. The American model um, and the English model were set up in the 18, 1870s, 1880s to manage what was a new industry, sports. You needed regular rules that everyone agreed, and you needed balance. You needed some form of competitive balance. The Americans set up, you know, teams could move, baseball teams could move. So if you were um, losing money in um, Buffalo, you could move your team to Cincinnati. Um, they imposed regulations on the control of players. They called the reserve clause. These were um, very effective in controlling costs for the American teams for baseball. Um, in England, the league was set up in 1888, it, it, 1889. It, it, it copied elements of the American model, um, retain and transfer, or sorry, pay and retain, as it was called, um, was the English equivalent of controls over players. Um, that was introduced in 1893. Um, the league itself was 12 teams originally, um, but it managed its competition in a different way, which is that it merged in 1892 with the Football Alliance and created the second division and introduced what is the fundamental difference between the two systems, which is promotion and relegation. Um, and that kind of worked for a long time. It worked effectively because the English clubs were able to control their costs through uh, pay and retain and through the maximum wage, which lasted until 1961. After that, what you saw was rigidities coming into the system. Um, the Eastern report, the end of the maximum wage, increased the fixed cost level of the English football clubs. And increasingly, relegation and promotion was, was, was damaging, or relegation in particular was damaging. Um, the rigidities made it like a giant game of snakes and ladders, uh, in which the ladder was actually pretty, you know, was good, but disproportionate was the relegation issue. So teams such as Aston Villa in the late 60s were relegated and fell two divisions almost automatically because of that fixed cost level. That risk increased um, after the Bosman uh, decision in 1995, when again, the risks um, of uh, finance in, in the clubs were enhanced and, and much greater. Uh, Norman Chester did his report in 68, where he looked at the, the funding and the financing of, of the English league I mean, he identified a plutocracy in 1968. Uh, he didn't name them, but there were six clubs, he said, that were um, plutocrats in a world of um, non-profitable other clubs. The other ones were very, it was a sort of pyramid with a, uh, he described it as a pointed pyramid with a very flat base. And those six teams were the same six teams that became, um, that pushed, they were called the big five in the 1980s and 90s, and they were the ones that drove the creation of the Premier League. Um, but the point I think is that the American model sees regulation, managed competition, balancing themselves um, with the antitrust authorities. Um, it's a cartel. It's a cartel at the expense of, of free entry into it and uh, player, player pay. Um, but the NFL and the National Basketball Association and Major League Baseball all spend an awful lot of time, in a sense, managing that process such that they have regulated, profitable businesses. The result of it is very interesting. Um, Forbes values American franchises every year. Um, 2017, I think the highest valued American football franchise was the Dallas Cowboys, 4.8 billion. The lowest was the Buffalo Bills at 1.8 billion. 
Um, those are the 32 teams. The average was 2.5. KPMG, not as good as Deloitte's, obviously, um, have their valuation model. Um, the same year of European clubs, the biggest club, I mean, obviously, is not of the market, is, uh, was Real Madrid, which they valued at $3.3 billion. The 32nd club was Olympic Marseille at 196 million. The average was 800, the median was 400. There's a huge tail of values in the football, in European football. And I see the American model, the American money thinking that, oh, well, we can get a hold of Olympic Marseille and turn it into Real Madrid. And I think that's part of what's been motivating the investments of American money coming over. But, you know, Randy Lerner, Ellis Short, um, Hicks and Gillette, very you know, smart, successful businessmen with lots of money, um, have all lost substantial sums of money in investments in, in English football. Um, it hasn't stopped. Uh, Rocco Camisso, um, who just invested into Fiorentina, has discovered when he acquired the team last summer that um, just before completion, a number of the contracts have been signed behind his back to sell the players. And he arrived essentially to see the cupboard was bare. So it's a very different industry than the American one. And I see, I think, as I said, Dan and Merritt are absolutely right that it will remain very much the way it is with adjustments to the, the shares of money that go to the bigger clubs in the redistribution of the European leagues, uh, the recreation of a lower league, such as used to be called the Fairs Cup um, between the teams in Macedonia and the 10th team in the English league. It, not an awful lot will change, but more money, I think, will ultimately be lost by investors who think this is a gold mine. Okay, Jane, your, your thoughts on that, what you've heard? Um, well, uh, first on the plutocracy, um, that has been created and is sustained by the amounts that um, the top teams can spend both on transfers but also on wages. And I think there is a, um, an interesting correlation between the amount that players are paid and success you know, with, you know, sort of Arsene Wenger sort of standing out in the past as being, if you um, sort of discounted for that, he was sort of getting the best value for money in terms of success per uh, pay per head. Um, so um, is is that an intractable cost problem, um, pay? That's one thing. The second thing about, uh, or does it just simply sustain the plutocracy because there's just a very limited number of clubs who can, um, you know, have play those high stakes, that high okay. stakes game. Um, and, but the other thing is that um, to break into the plutocracy, and it's interesting that Manchester City would be a good example, um, because Manchester City is not, is not the one with the sort of long storied history in the way that Manchester United uh, has, for example. Um, th they managed it through you know, enormous sugar daddy money um, for an investment, um, but they had to sail pretty close to the wind to do it and maybe you know, just survived the investigation into that last year. So how do these factors play into this sustaining of a plutocracy, even with the sort of slight inconvenience of promotion relegation? Okay, let me ask Dan on that. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the issue is correctly identified, Jane, in terms of, you know, what is the biggest sort of financial challenge facing professional football? And it is, is the wage bill. So, um, you know, if, if you look at the graphs that we've diligently plotted over the last 30 years, um, of revenue growth that you know any other industry would die for that continued through any number of crises and even I think the the, the, the pandemic will even only be a you know, a v-shape um, uh, graph um, you know it, it sailed through the financial crisis without any great turbulence so the, the revenue side of professional football has been extremely successful um, if you then add a couple of other lines to that graph you have a cost line that grows very steeply, actually grows marginally more steeply than the revenue line. And the, that's primarily driven by wages and within wages, primarily by players' wages. And you then have a, a profit line or more particularly a losses line that sort of bumps along the bottom at, at best. Um, in the Premier League, it's a little bit better than that. Um, and basically that is just because the Premier League has more money than everybody else. So it, everybody around Europe can spend themselves to a standstill and the Premier League still got some money left and the others haven't. Um, so you, you still have some residual profit left in, 
in Premier League clubs. In terms of dealing with that, I mean, again, talking about institutional investors, US investors, if you're looking for steady returns, you know, the, um, the getting rid of relegation is, is an interesting idea. Um, question what that does to value in terms of the competition, because um, I do talk to people in US sports who say that, you know, the problem is we have an awful lot of dead rubbers towards the end of the season. Actually, the drama of relegation is a great way of sustaining value and interest and making every game matter right through to the end of a end of a season. So, but, you know, the relegation risk, you know, when you're working with investors looking at modelling the acquisition of a big club, uh, you know, so one that's, you know, a, a perennial top division club, they know they know relegation is there as a risk, but it doesn't affect their valuation because they see the risk as as infinitesimal. So going back to you know uh, Murad's point earlier on about fifteen percent chances, this is more of the less than one percent chance of a overall breakaway. Is, is how it would be viewed. The, the thing that would really change the dial for valuation is if you could see how the profit margins increase because you could grow revenue without the wage bill growing as well. So you then get into the realms of salary caps um, or, you know, financial fair play, profitability and sustainability regulations, those, those kind of things. The, the, the problem with those things is you need to be very, very clear on, on what problem you are trying to fix through that re- regulation. Now, UEFA, for all that it's been knocked, I think, you know, the, the facts kind of speak for themselves that financial fair play has had a significant impact on the finances of European football. It has curtailed losses pretty significantly and it has stopped people defaulting on payments pretty significantly. Um, but the criticism of that would be that the way they've done it is by you know, addressing that issue of trying to stop losses and therefore you know, they have you know, inevitably to some degree locked in the existing order because the more revenue you have, the more you can spend on the wage bill before you start incurring losses. And therefore the pecking order of revenue becomes the pecking order of wage bill, which fortunately it's not quite as direct and 100% correlated as this, but other things being equal becomes more likely to be the pecking order of performance on the pitch as well. So if you say, actually what we want to do is we want to level the playing field, you go down the road of the sort of um, cost controls that you have in premiership rugby, for example, which is a, a salary cap that is equal for everybody. And then to use a phrase that's very topical in uh, the UK at the moment, is that about levelling up or is that about levelling down? So do you say to, uh, you know, a Manchester United, you can only spend this much because that's all Burnley can afford to spend. And therefore you have a very, very profitable business at Manchester United, but jeopardy about where you finish in the league table. Or do you level up and take the shackles off and do what, you know, European football has done right up until probably the last sort of 10 years or so with financial fair play and say, spend what you like, wherever you can get the money from, just go out there and spend it. You know, whether it's Roman Abramovich coming in at Chelsea, whether it's Sheikh Mansour coming in at Manchester City, whatever you need to do, wherever you can find the money, go spend it. Yeah, let's say fair, let's just go for it. And that, of course, ends in tears in a number of places. You know, for every, for every Manchester City and Chelsea, there are a significantly greater number of clubs who had the owner who came in who was going to throw money at it and make a difference. And, you know, whether through luck, ill judgment, not having quite as deep pockets as they thought, um, it didn't turn out that way. Murad, what's your view on uh, salary caps and uh, the wage problem and, and the uncontrollable nature of costs, it would appear? Yeah, I, I think it's... It, it, it is a key issue, as Dan and everybody has has, has pointed out. Um, in fact, in the, in the Super League conversations, the the key element that I think is uh, underwritten is the introduction of of a salary cap. Um, Dan's question of whether we, you know, get rid of um, essentially get rid of uh, existing financial fair play regulations, which was a solution. I, I've speak I spoke to people who were there at the birth of it, and they toyed around with a salary cap. They felt like they probably couldn't get it past European regulators. So they kind of had this kind of weird solution um, uh, that is an effective salary cap in some ways, um, but isn't quite because people have worked out, like clubs have worked out to game it uh, essentially. Um, so, uh, but it's it, it's done what 
it, it, it's intended to do, which is to kind of prevent losses and basically prevent bankruptcies in um, in European football. So I think a salary cap is is the sort of thing that is going to come back in some form. I think you're much more likely to see it in the form that is currently taking place in Spain, where La Liga clubs have effectively um, given themselves a salary cap where the league sets a spending limit on wages and transfer fees every season according to turnover. Um, that is a financial control that essentially sets in stone uh, in, for the most part where where clubs are going to finish uh, every season. But um, it, it it is a it is a kind of a, an effective measure that uh, on on the sustainability of, uh, of clubs, and I think what you're actually also seeing is maybe there are other ways to tackle the cost problem. So you're already seeing FIFA um, in, in, encouraged by the biggest clubs to go after the agent industry to cap um, commissions that agents can get to prevent them being able to be on. Um, multiple sides of a transaction to do all sorts of things which uh, uh, they would argue is professionalizing the industry. And you're already seeing the super agents who have made the most money from the existing kind of wild west of transfers. People like Jonathan Barnett, Mina Raiola, uh, uh, George Mendes all gather, uh, create their own kind of trade body and lawyer up ready for whatever regulations come uh, come down um the bend and they're all you can already see them all already gathering well how are we going to make money if they if the clubs get this through so you had this kind of strange thing was Latin ibrahimovic writes on on twitter or instagram that he's not quite sure how the fifa video game have have got rights to his name uh, has anybody heard about this and then uh, zlatan is uh, is represented by mina raiola and then within minutes gareth bale represented by jonathan barnett says yes i don't know what's going on here and you can see already see the outline of of a new attack uh, uh, a new ways that um, agents and, and players can make money in a new world where the, uh, where salaries are are much more regulated uh, as well. So I think cost control is key, and also the thing that is driving American investors because they want to know uh, how they can extract money out of clubs themselves. And uh, the one thing I, I actually think about salaries, that, um, footballers get a bad rap in the sense, but there aren't that many industries where seventy percent of of uh, the revenues. Uh, goes to the labour force, um, and and this is treated as a terrible thing by the very people who watch football. When actually, if you adjust this, um, the money is actually going to go into the billionaire owners' hands as well. So, the socialist in me thinks it's not it's not that terrible a system as it is. Okay, I want to ask each of you uh, two questions. Uh, I, I... Andrew gets gets to go first. What it, one is put yourself three three years into the future. What do you see English or European football looking like, uh, both in terms of its structure and in terms of its financial viability? And secondly, if you were an American investor, would you buy? Andrew Aaron's first. Well, I'm going to. Quickly say one thing in response to the to Mirad's very interesting point about the, the Spanish position, which is that Americans have the leagues have transparency in terms of wages. You actually know what the NFL teams have are play, are paid, and um, any form of salary cap has to have that. And I can't see the the European agents or the European clubs allowing that kind of transparency. Um, you'll have all the fiddles that you've had historically and you had in rugby more recently. In terms of what English football will look, I think it'll look pretty much the same, frankly. Um, I think there will be a widening gap between the uh, top teams. Once you have um, you know, crowds back in again and you have a, a, the normal game, you will have the richer clubs making money, playing in Europe, um, the competition for the what was it the Wenger Trophy as we used to describe it coming forth for the Champions League, um, more European competitions um, that trickle the the um, the money down the league uh, the Premier League, which is useful because in a sense it sustains the competition. In the old days, 
once there was a champion and then you had two teams relegated, the, there were a lot of dead ties in, in the old first division. And one of the things of the Premier League competitions, both with relegation and the extra European competitions, is to create these mini leagues which keep people interested. Um, the second question is, would I invest in it? No, I mean, I, you know, the old line about the NFL is it's 32 guys who vote Republican and manage a socialist business. Mm -hmm. um, it's 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 a very very clever model, and it takes a long time to create that model. It took years for Pete Rozelle and that whole group of of early NFL AFL uh, owners to get together to agree to the form of competitive balance. It is in the DNA of the NFL as to be or not to be is in the DNA of Shakespeare. It's, it's also required. Um, and a, a, a required a waiver of antitrust legislation in the U.S. And Absolutely, but managed antitrust. It's not, you know, the, and one of the reasons is the unions are very strong in, in American sports. Again, the paradox, you know, in Europe, we have this, you know, red-toothed capitalistic market in sports. The U.S. has, you know, revenue sharing, um, reverse reverse order draft, powerful unions, pensions, healthcare, ignoring the issue about um, concussion industries and paying the full economic wages. You know, but you have all of that. You look at the, the PFA in the UK or in England, it's it's you know not a union, it's it's a it's a company union basically. Um, it's an extraordinary reversal of a sense of normal economic um, relations between the US and Europe with perception of them. So as an American investor, yeah, I would if I, but I'd also buy a lottery ticket, Andrew. If I, wanted, <laughs> if I wanted to invest in an expensive painting that would hold its value, I would buy an American football franchise because no one has ever lost money buying a football team and then selling it. <laughs> okay, Dan, the same two questions to you. Um, where do you see uh, English and European football three years from now and would you actually buy? So um, I'm going to say something uh, that's, that's a little bit dull and very similar to what Andrew said about where things will be in three years' time, um, which is that I think it will look remarkably similar. I think if you're looking at the 2023-2024 season, um, you, you will find it recognisable. The great thing that will by then be a reality again is that they will be playing in front of Pack Stadium again and um, I can't personally wait for that to happen. Um, that's been one of... There's been lots of things about this year that have been uh, pretty tough, but... Um, not being able to go and watch live sporting events has been one of the, the hardest aspects for, for me personally. In terms of um, would I buy, probably depends how much money I'm starting with. Um, but if I am of the serious mega wealthy type um, who, who are looking at buying into Premier League football club at the moment, I think I probably would. And, and the reason being that it, you know, it's a whole load of drama, it's a whole load of fun. And, and actually going back to the fundamentals of, of why is there value in in top level professional sport i think if you were to create something out of nothing now and you said look i've got this thing that is great fantastic live unscripted drama it can dominate social media you can get all the analytics out of it that you could ever possibly want people will throw their data at you because of their passion and their love for this activity um, I've got this thing, I'm going to create it. You know, that, that would be the unicorn to end all unicorns in terms of, you know, things that would get an investor excited right now. And, and sport does that. Football does it better than any other sport in the world because it is the world's number one global sport. And if you go right to the pinnacle of, you know, what's the most successful annual football competition in the world right now, you'd say the Premier League. So, yeah, I probably I probably would. And because... Going to Andrew's point about, you know, you don't lose money buying an NFL team. It's riskier buying a big Premier League club, but there is never a shortage of people in the queue to be the person to come and take it off you once you've sort of um, had your fill of doing it. Okay, I can't resist asking you, which one would you buy? <laughs> well, which one would I buy? It would, it would all depend on, on how much I had at my disposal. Clearly, you know, my allegiance is pretty well uh, is pretty well known. Um, you know, for me, Manchester United is the obvious choice. But um, yeah, it depends how depends how much you've got available in your uh, checkbook or from your backers. <laughs> Morad, the final word is with you. The same two questions: what, What's it going to look like, and uh, and would you buy? I'm going to agree um, with um, our, our, our friends, but with with some um, uh, with some adjustments. I, I think yes. English and European football is going to look 
uh, quite similar. But if I were the the middling clubs, the Everton's and the um, uh, and the Aston Villas of uh, of of the Premier League, I would have snapped the hands off of uh, of the offer of Project Big Picture um, because essentially. They were uh, they were giving voting power up to the big clubs who are already the big clubs. They already have this uh, level of power, but they're also guaranteeing twenty five percent of revenues down through the, the through the football pyramid. Any club that's between ninth and twentieth every season has a strong risk of relegation. It just happens. This is the nature of football. They're all going to get relegated at some point or another. Why not create a system where they're not completely? Um, for want of a better word, screwed by uh, relegation by having this kind of trickle-down effect of money flowing through the game. Um, in fact, g- going to 18 teams means that, the, uh, uh, the, yes, they're more likely to get relegated now, but in the longer term, you know, they get the benefits of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, the, of having less teams up there um, uh, as well. So I think, I think something like Project Pic- a Big Picture is going to keep coming back up and isn't actually a bad idea for the governance of, of English football. I think there will be probably bigger change in the Champions League. I really, they're, they're talking about something called a Swiss model for the group stage. Instead of having groups of four, you end up um, at, uh, any team playing 10 completely different opponents um, and uh, all appearing in the same league table. I feel like that sounds considerably more different to uh, existing European football. We've got the group state of the Champions League going uh, on right now. The 16 teams that are going to qualify are pre- by and large going to be the 16 richest teams in, in Europe. It's pretty boring. Let's get on with uh, kind of sorting that tournament out. Um, and I think big change is going to happen there. Would I buy... I? Uh, funnily enough, um, in a different way from Dan, I'm, I'm, um, I, I'm not going to get a consultancy fee for um uh, for advising investors to buy so i can take the opposite um opinion although I, i'd love to cover a megabuck deal in in saying i don't think that uh, uh buying into a club um in uh, in say England or Europe is is a very secure investment. You've got to have a healthy healthy appetite for risk. Um, if you want to buy into the more the less risky clubs, right at the top, um, the top six in in England, for example, then you're going to have to pay a check in the billions, and nobody's ever paid that check before. And I think there's a, probably a reason why that's the case. You know, you've got these uh, owners who have built done brilliantly um in building the value of their businesses but can't really find anyone to um to to pay them at, at, at the end of it so we're still waiting to see i think that uh, if i was an american investor i'd buy into an american sports team because um american investors in my experience they they love to talk about competition and the value of co- uh, competition but more than anything they love protectionism they love monopolies um and buying into them and football, thankfully, is not. Um, it, it doesn't have protectionist in, um, instincts. And the history of football is that they tend not to be monopolies. You can uh, fall and you can rise throughout that sport. I think I should. I, I'm not sure. Andrew Aaron's will probably correct me, but I don't think Everton has ever been relegated. On the other Everton, hand, no, Everton has. I'm afraid, Andrew. Um, Everton were relegated in the 1950s. Arsenal are the only team, technically, after the First World War or after the restart, not to have been relegated. Well, I'm um, old enough to remember when Manchester United were relegated. Those were the good old days. Let me tell you. Can I thank all of you? Uh, my colleague Jane Fuller, Murad Ahmed, Andrew Aaron's, and Dan Jones, and of course you for watching. Many, many thanks.